Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Welcome to another episode of Product Spotlight. We're going to head out to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we're going to connect with Michael Cleveland of Ultimate Antler Deer Feed. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bruce. Well, I'm excited. You and I met, I believe, on social media where I meet most of my guests. And we started talking about deer and nutrition and what it takes to grow big deer, what it takes to hold big deer. So that's why I wanted to invite you on the show. So let's just take it off and right at the top. And why did you get involved in the deer nutrition business? Well, it all started back when I was 12 years old, kind of like most people, you know. Um, my dad took me hunting, and, and the first time he took me, I fell in love with white-tailed deer, and, and that's been my passion my whole life. And so, I'm just normal, just like everybody else. The only thing different for me than anybody else is I had the passion. It bit me so hard that that was my whole life. And so, you know, over the years, hunting and and taking animals and harvesting different animals, you know, I'm just like everybody else. After a while, you know, I mean, you get tired of shooting the two and three year olds and you just want to shoot bigger animals. So that's what my passion turned into. I started letting deer walk, trying to let them get a year older, you know, a year bigger. And just like everybody else, I mean, everybody else deals with this too, you know, as soon as they jump the fence, your neighbors shoot them. So, you know, that's just part of, of free range, free chase whitetails, you know. So, We started back a little over 20 years ago, and we started intensely managing our whitetail herd. You know, we enrolled in all of the, I live in Oklahoma, so we enrolled in all of the Oklahoma uh, management programs that the Oklahoma Wildlife Department offers. We had food plots, we had alfalfa circles, we had mineral sites, we had everything. We did everything that the Wildlife Department told us. You know, we let deer walk. We tried to manage our deer herds as far as having the right buck to doe ratio, all that. We'll get into that a little bit, you know, here deeper into the episode. I'd like to talk about that. But, you know, basically just like everybody else. And we was letting deer go from one year to the next. And then all of a sudden, you know, Mother Nature, you know, how she all too often, how she does. She blessed us with a five-year drought here in Northwest Oklahoma. And in that five years, we had a little over 2.3 inches of rain in five years. So, you know, there was nothing out there for the deer to eat, no browse, nothing. Uh, if it wasn't something that we planted and had an irrigation, there was nothing out there for the whitetails to, to eat. So what happened is, is on one particular farm that we have, my partner and I, Randy Lively, that's in the business with me, He's got a, a place where he grows alfalfa, and, it, and that alfalfa had been there for four or five years. The deer had grown up on the alfalfa, and that was basically the only thing around for them to eat. We had deer coming from miles around. And during that time period, you know, alfalfa, it's good. It's about 30% protein. So the deer had all the protein that they needed. And during that time that we had that drought, you know, the deer actually from one year to the next, instead of getting bigger, they actually gotten a little smaller. So we had deer that were on trail camera pictures that we had taken inventory of. And you can tell exactly what deer it is. Their, their rack looks exactly the same from one year to the next. And from the deer being four to five years old, they actually went backwards. They lost seven to 10 inches of antler growth. And typically between that four and five year Age, that's their biggest jump. And our deer actually went backwards. So I got with my cousin, which at the time, he was a a wildlife biologist for the state of Oklahoma. And then one of our best friends, he's this assistant director of the Oklahoma Wildlife Department. We got with them, started talking to them about management practices and how we could actually grow these deer bigger. Well, my cousin, he was a game biologist. He told me to get in contact with the University of Texas A&M down in Texas. And, and they've been managing wildlife and putting supplemental feed out for these wild deer for years. And 
basically I got in contact with them and how that came all evolved and came about was what they actually did was they put some mineral out for the deer and they started feeding these deer. And then what they would do is they'd collect the feces and then send it off to have it analyzed. And it was showing no traces or no amounts of mineral. So they started adding more and they started adding more. Once they started getting the mineral in the feces, then they knew at that point in time that that was the amount of mineral that was required for a deer to grow its antlers. So then what we did is, I mean, and that's public knowledge. You can go on their website. You can Google it, whatever. They'll give you that information. They'll tell you what minerals are required to grow the antlers. <clears throat> well, there's two types of minerals that, that are out there. There's your micro minerals and there's your core minerals. And so the number one mineral associated to antler development is selenium. Of course, then you have your phosphorus, your phosphate, your calcium, your copper, your zinc. You have all the minerals that's required to grow the antlers. So what we did is we took that, we blended it in with the protein because deer will eat protein every day. Now the mineral you pour it out, and I challenge everybody to do this, but pour mineral out on the ground and then set a trail camera up against it. And what's going to happen is, is when you first pour it out, they're going to come and they're going to hammer it because they're mineral deficient. Their bodies are needing the mineral. So they're going to eat and you're going to get pictures of them two or three nights in a row. Then once they're, they get everything that their body is required in the minerals, they'll stop touching it for four or five days. Well, then after four or five days, they'll come back to the mineral sites and they'll eat it. And then they won't touch it again for four or five days. And that's because wild animal only consume mineral when their body requires it. Well, they'll eat the protein every day. So what we did is we took the protein and we blended in the mineral right into the protein. So we're force feeding them the mineral. They're getting the mineral every day that they eat the protein. That won't hurt them. They're going to utilize what they can and what they don't. They're going to just expel. So what we did is in our research and development, we took that and then we added a probiotic. Once we added the probiotic to the feed, we started sending that off and then we no longer got mineral in our, in our feces anymore. So then we started adding more mineral and more mineral until we started getting mineral in our, in our results that was at the laboratory then we knew that that was the maximum amount of mineral that a whitetail could consume. So that's what our, my feet, that's what it comprises of. The secret is, is blending the correct minerals that grows the antlers in with the protein. Now our protein, and there's, you know, anything, I'll never talk bad about anybody's product because any product that's out there on the market is going to be better than what mother nature provides. Where I think that my feed sets aside other than any other feed is our protein is made up of all natural components. So we use soybean meal, cottonseed meal. We put all of the vitamins and minerals that are required to grow the antlers in our feed. Mo There's some feeds out there that they use urea to make up their protein. They use chicken feathers to make up their protein content, and we don't. Everything's all natural. So that's kind of what sets us aside from all the others. Once we added that supplemental feed to our management program, the very first year that we had the product out, those deer that were four-year-old that went to five-year-olds and actually went backwards, we've got them going from five-year-old to six-year-old and they averaged 20 inches of antler growth the first year and they averaged, you know, 40 to 50 pounds of body weight more. So we not only help the antlers, we help the body weight. We also put a calcium mineral pack in our feed that helps with lactating does so that whenever they have fawns, they jumpstart the fawns off to a better start. Now, are you feeding year round or just during, you know, when they drop their antlers, they stop growing their antlers. So I don't know what it is in Oklahoma, but in places it's March. And so tell me about your feeding regimen. So we feed year round. And the reason we feed year round is, is because deer they can store the micro minerals in their fat reserves. So by feeding year round, what that does is they have those micro minerals are in their fat reserves. And as soon as they shed their antlers within 10 to 12 days, they actually will start growing the new antlers. So that way they have the minerals in their system and they're ready to go as soon as they start growing antlers. Now here's the deal. I'm average just like everybody else and I want to do things the best way that I can but I want to do it the cheapest way I can. So you are actually going to get a benefit 
If you feed the product from the 1st of February and feed it till the end of August during the antler growing phase, okay? Now then, if you want to cheapen up your bill and you want to, at the end of August when they're done growing antlers and you want to feed corn or whatever you want to feed that's cheaper, you know, go ahead and do that. You're not hurting anything, but you're actually, you're going to lose two to three weeks whenever they start growing antlers again by not feeding year round. Now then, a lot of, I tell a lot of people, you know, you're going to lose two to three weeks. Now, what does that equate to in inches? You know, I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, it's, it might be five inches. It might be 10 inches. But you're still going to see a benefit if you start feeding the first of February and you feed all the way to the end of August. So I leave it up to the individual. I mean, you know, fortunately, you know, the good Lord's blessed me with a good enough job that I can afford to feed my deer year round. I'm not going to tell anybody that they can't do it. The whole secret to it is, is once you start feeding it at the beginning of February is to make sure you have it in front of that animal the whole time. So if he goes, if you put it out in February and you don't go back and fill it up again till March and he doesn't have that out there in front of him for those months, then that's going to be critical. So you have to have it out whenever you start feeding them. Make sure that it's available for him all the way through the antler growing phase. What are we talking about year round feeding? What does it run? So my product, we sell it for $13.50 for a 50 pound bag. And I will challenge anybody to find it any cheaper, you know, I mean, we, cause we have everything in it that's required to grow the antlers. So 1350, you know, and, and depending on deer density, deer numbers, you know, everybody's still going to be a little bit different, but we, what we recommend is we recommend to feed it year round and we recommend to have one feeder per every two that you have. Now then, Whenever you put that feeder out, we challenge everybody and we like to have that next to or as close to a water source as possible. I know not everybody has a windmill or a pond or a creek or some sort of a water source. If you don't, you can make your own, you know, put a tank out there, get you a nurse tank and go fill it up under, out of your faucet, haul it out to your location, open a valve and create your own water source, but have the feed as close to a water source and as close to a bedding area as possible. Because if you have those three elements, you're going to hold deer on your property longer. So if you have feed, water, and food, you're going to hold your deer on your property longer. And until the rut comes or the pre-rut comes and those deer start breaking out of their bachelor herds and fighting and establishing dominance, you're going to hold those deer on your property. So what's your ratio? Did you say two bucks per 50 pounds? Yes. So what they'll do is, is every deer is different. We've done quite a bit of studies on this and we figured that they're going to eat anywhere from a pound and a half to three pounds a day is what is per animals, what they'll eat. No. What about those? Cause I want bucks to grow the horns. I'm, those don't have horns. So are they going to eat the food too and take away from the bucks? No, they won't take away from the bucks. So you want your does to eat too, because the whole thing is, is, is you want them fawns to be jump started off. You want your baby deer to be as healthy as you want your whole herd to be healthy. Right. So your bucks and everybody that has feeders and has had cameras out on these feeders, you've witnessed this. So what happens is, is you have a feeder and you're going to have a dominant buck that's going to claim that feeder. And whenever he comes up there and starts eating, he's going to keep everything else off the feeder. So what happens is, is whenever you're feeding this in the spring and the summer, whenever they're in their bachelor groups, what's going to happen is, is your bachelor herd is going to come up and they're going to eat out of this. And they're going to eat for three to five minutes and then they're going to leave. And then your does will come up and then they're going to feed and then they're going to feed for three to five minutes and then they're going to leave. And they're going to go to water and they're going to get water and they're going to bed down. And then about four hours later, they're going to come back. And so every one of your groups of deer will come back, but they'll be separated. And then you're going to have another couple of does that are going to come eat. And then maybe six or eight more does are going to come eat. And then your bucks are going to come. And then they're going to eat. And then they're going to leave. And then you're going to have another group of doe, uh, bucks that are going to come. They're going to eat. So you're benefiting your whole herd. So you're not just benefiting one or two deer. So it behooves somebody to really know what kind of deer herd they had, what their census is. 
Because if you put out 50 pounds, what I'm hearing you say, you know, that could be gone real quick. If you get 25 deer, that could be done in a day. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's why we recommend people using, and I don't care what brand, a gravity type heater, you know, that's, you know, 800 pounds or more. And then that way, you know, all your deer are going to come and you're going to benefit from that. Now then, when we first started, you know, like I said, we're just average guys out here and we didn't have a lot of money to spend, you know, in gravity style feeders. We had spinner type feeders. Well, so what we did is we would just go pour it out on the ground. We would pour a 50 pound bag out on the ground and we would go back the next day and we would check it. If it was gone, we'd pour out another 50 pounds, you know. If it was gone every day, then we started learning, hey, we needed to pour it out 100 pounds at a time or whatever, a couple bags. But the problem with that is, is, you know, with Mother Nature and the elements and rain and stuff like that, you waste raccoons, turkeys, you know, you waste a lot of of feed like that. So we recommend getting a feeder that's a gravity style feeder. And then that way it's up high enough off the ground that the raccoons and the turkeys and, and everything's not robbing, you know, the feed from the deer. Now, folks, it's going to be legal to feed in your state, you know, in some states, in some areas, some counties it isn't so before you jump into the process you know make sure it's legal where your land is that's for sure i'm sorry i was gonna say there's some states that will allow you to supplemental feed your deer but they won't let you hunt over it so you need to check your rules and regulations before you put any of it out now let's get back so you had drought for four or five years and your deer hair was going backwards you started this program you did some scientific research and studies and figured it out now, how large is the area that you're feeding on? So I have a couple different places. Like I said, my buddy that's, that's partners with me in the deer feeding, he has a couple different places, and he has one area that's about 1,700 acres. The areas that I have, I have one that is 120 acres. And everybody says, you know, well, you can't manage deer on 120 acres. Well, I mean, everybody has their own opinion, but I have, I mean, I have data. I have proof that I've done a pretty good job of that. And like I said, there's three key elements that you got to have, and that's cover. You got to provide food and you got to provide water. If you have those three elements, you can, and I mean, I've got perfect examples like this deer right here. He's a nine pointer. He scores 167 and five eighths. And I shot him as a four year old year before last. This last year, I shot this deer right here. He's a four year old and he scores 176 and seven eighths as four year olds. And I shot them on 120 acres. And how I did that was, is I grew them deer. I mean, I had pictures of them from the time they was two years old. Now then, what I did is I provided food, I provided water, and I provided cover. And I allowed them deer to get to four and a half years old. Now, luckily, my neighbors are on the same program that I am. And we all get together and we talk about it. And we say, you know, we're not shooting this deer until he gets old enough. Now, you know, I could argue that if I'd have let those deer get to five and a half or six and a half, you know, they'd have been mega giants. But I, I just, I've been hunting for a long time and it's hard for me to pass up anything that goes over 165. So I shot <laughs> four years old and that was, that was due to my feed. You know, those deer, those deer put on, you know, 30 to 40 inches every year. And I mean, they're just exceptionally nice deer. Anybody would be challenged to see a 150 inch deer walk past you, what you know is four and a half years old. Those are mature deer. And, you know, any shot you shoot or any shot you take, it's, it's your hunt. And if you're into growing big deer, you know, it, it's really hard to, to pull off them and say, eh, I'm going to, on 120 acres, we got friendly neighbors, let's say, but, eh, you know, it, it'd be hard. It really, you know, It'd be, it'd be hard. It is. It is. And like, I, I, I am so passionate and I'm into growing big deer. So, but I don't begrudge anybody if, if they, if it's your, you know, if you haven't been hunting, if you've been hunting for 50 years and 20 inch comes to you and it rips your trigger, they shoot it. I'm all for it. But for me personally, I just like growing big deer, and if I can if I can harvest them, that's a that's a bonus. If I can't, then 
I really enjoy watching them from year to year and to see how big they get. Now let's talk about your hunting 20 acres. Cause that, you know, for Western Oklahoma, that's pretty small. You know, that's like 40 acres or 20 acres in Wisconsin, actually. So let's talk about the topography of it. Absolutely. So where I hunt at, it is about a half a mile off of the Canadian river. And on that 120 acres, there's probably less than 40 acres. I'd say 30 to 35 acres of woods, of trees, of hardwoods. The rest of it's open prairie, grass, flat, it's flat. And from where the river is, my place is kind of a transition period. So the river is north of me, and then I'm south of the river, and then south of me is the is the agriculture the alfalfa in the in the winter wheat so my place is is it's it's pretty good because i'm kind of the transition period i have some bedding area but not a lot not like the river does but i do have some hardwoods i do have water and i have managed that i've taken let the cedars grow up in that area that i have so i have a lot of thermal winter cover so it's good bedding area for the deer to get out of the thermal winter so they, whenever the wind's cold and blowing hard like it does in Oklahoma all the time, they have a place to get in and bed down. And so in my area, I can hold the deer. I feed them. I water them. I provide that cover. I offer everything that they need until the rut comes along. So, uh, you know, I don't have, you know, like you said, uh, if it was in Illinois or Iowa or Wisconsin or somewhere that was heavily wooded, my 120 acres would be like 20 or 30 acres up there. Well, you've done a heck of a job. And I just love, you know, how you really thought through the process of what the deer needs and, you know, how to measure that they're absorbing it, using it or throwing it off their body. So then you get back to the, you know, to the basics. And the thing is, I think you're right when you mention that once you start a feeding program, you got to commit to that because it does really doesn't do you any good if, if you start something and don't just carry it on. So it is work. Being a 365 hunter is, is work. Now, living where you do, how far is it to your farm? So where I live, I live in Tulsa, and it's three and a half hours from my place here in Tulsa where I live to my place where I hunt in northwest Oklahoma. So who, who takes care of the feeding for you? I do. I do it all. And so I have, and like I said, I'm not plugging for any uh, feed uh, feeder manufacturer. I'm not doing that. But I have, I have some feeders, and they're 600-pound feeders. And on my 120 acres, I have two feeders. And I have about 60 deer on that 120 acres. And I've done that from deer studies from night spotlight counts that we do with the Oklahoma Wildlife Department. So I know about how many deer I have. So I have two 600-pound feeders, and what that does is that lasts me about 13 to 15 days. So every other weekend, I'm going home and filling up feeders. So two tens a month? Yes. Basically. And there are certain times of the year that the deer will consume more than other times. So coming right out of winter, like January and February, they consume like that three pounds a day. Now then, like right now in Oklahoma, the good Lord's blessed us with a lot of moisture. And so we have a lot of brows. So like right now, the deer aren't consuming as much as they normally would. So they're consuming about a pound to a pound and a half a day. And so like this time of year, I can let my feeders go three weeks. Other times of the year, I have to go every two weeks. So I just make it a point to go and I fill them up every two weeks, whether they're completely empty and I need to fill them completely full or whether they're half full and I just need to fill them up halfway to top them off. Well, you were smart to start a business because you're going to grow deer and it takes feed to do it. So you own the company. So good on you. Absolutely. And here's <laughs> the thing about it, you know, I mean, most hunters, if you think about it, most hunters, they don't feed year round. So they don't, you know, but they watch TV and they say, hey, you know, I saw some fancy hunter on TV the other day, and he shot a 180-inch deer. You know, I'm, I want to go out, and I'm going to hunt hard. I'm going to hunt the wind right. I'm going to do everything that I can, and I'm going to shoot me 180. Well, let's be honest about it. If you don't have a 180-inch deer where you hunt, you're not going to kill a 180-inch deer. 
So what you have to do is you have to think back and you think, okay, well, what do I got? And you have to grow that deer. If you want to shoot, I don't care if it's a 130 inch deer and you have to provide everything for that animal that mother nature doesn't provide in order to do that. So I feed year round. I give everything. I give my deer everything that he needs to grow that rack during that antler growing phase. That's great. Let's talk about, let's switch it up. Oh, before we do that, how do people reach out to you? How do they get on your website? How do they buy your product? So, I mean, they can go to the website. We have our website is ultimate antler deer feed, all one word at gmail.com. I'm sorry, at, at dot net. And then our email is ultimate antler deer feed at com. They can fake, they can get on Facebook and look at our Facebook page, ultimate antler deer feed, or they can call us. They can call 580-334-4181. They call 580-273-332. And I love talking about whitetails, and I'll, I'll talk all day long when somebody wants to talk about it. <laughs> Why don't you give us those numbers again? So it is 580-334-4181 or 580-273-3320. I'd like for people to go out and look at our Facebook page. I've got a good friend of mine that has a, a high fence deer farm. And he has allowed us to do a lot of research and development on his facility. And whenever we first started with this program, we asked him, you know, we said, you know, can we conduct some research and development on your facility? And he said, yeah, absolutely. He said, now then, he said, I'll let you do it for a year. And he said, if it works, he said, I'll tell everybody I know. But he said, if it doesn't work, I'll tell everybody I know. And so he allowed us, he had 15 deer, 15 year old bucks in one pen and they're all pretty well the same genetics so i had him i said open up the pen let eight of them out we're going to put them in this pen we're going to feed them my feed and my feed only and then your pen your seven in your pen you feed them the feed that you know that you've been feeding for years and in the pen that had the eight bucks in it the first year those deer Without the feed the first year, those deer, it's a pen facility, so they pull blood off of them. They weigh them. We cut the antlers off of them. We measured the antlers. And the antler development between both pens, the eight that was in my pen and the seven that was in his pen, they were pretty consistent. Now then, we fed the eight in that pen, my feed, and then he fed just a regular feed. He fed that to his seven. After one year of being on the feed, the eight bucks in that pen averaged 60 pounds more of body weight than the deer that was in his pen. It averaged 110 more inches of antler development than the seven that was in his pen. Wow. You can leave her out of him and he feeds everything on his farm and is fed with mine. We have 27 deer farms that are on our feed and we have hundreds of hunters and sportsmen that do the fair chase wild deer. We have a lot of customers on that one. And, you know, we've gotten the same results year after year, you know, depending on where you're at, the drought we're having, you know, anywhere from 25 to 40 inches of antler development from one year to the next. You know, we was talking a little bit earlier and I'd kind of like to circle around to that. You know, we're talking about, you know, the things that have impact on antler development. And so you have got to provide that nutrition for that animal. And the other thing to it is stress. You know, every, pe- there's a lot of people that don't think about that, but stress is the number one factor in antler development. And so whenever, you know, it's 117 degrees out in August here in Oklahoma, that creates a lot of stress on these animals. And so as I went back to earlier, by providing the food, the water, and the cover in the same area, that provides less stress on these animals because they can go lay down in the shade during the day until it cools off during the night. Then they're not having to use a lot of energy going and searching for food and water and stuff like that. By providing it to them, it creates less stress on the animals and that in turn allows them to to grow more antlers also. Let's talk about now about how you hunt your woods and your 120 acres because in the right conditions, you could be in a ground blind and you could hunt, you know, if you have topography, if it's not pool table flat, you know, you can hunt that way, especially if deers are coming off, deer are coming off the Canadian River. 
and you know heading through your property to to food every day because they will travel that far absolutely so what i do and and what i and i do i do i help a lot of people out I go look at their properties and you know tell them where they need to hang stands and put ears out put water sources and stuff like that so what i like to do is i like to get a, a topo map of the area and then you know mother nature provides natural bottlenecks natural funnels etc and so i like to find those natural corridors those natural travel patterns and like on my place that i have that's 120 acres like i said earlier i've got about 30 acres of woods and that's basically split into two sections on the east half i have a set of timber that borders up to the river that is nothing but cedar thickets, really thick bedding area cedar thickets. And so, you know, it's not like pool table flat, but I mean, if you're standing up, a six foot man can stand up and he can see clear to the other end of the of the property. But there is little rises and little falls in there. But the way that the trees grow in there makes a natural funnel coming from this bedding area, kind of like a shelter belt or, or a tree row, and there's a natural funnel area that funnels those deer out to that where they can have that transition period before they go out to the destination food plots, which is the alfalfa and the winter wheat. And so I do have a ground blind set up there. I have that set up for my sons. I've got a five-year-old and 11-year-old that are absolutely ate up with hunting also, and they crossbow hunt. So I set them up in that. But typically, I like to get up off the ground, and we have a lot of cottonwood trees in Oklahoma on our river bottoms. And so I like to set, you know, 25 foot up in the air. And one thing that I do a little bit different than most people is I do not hunt until conditions are perfect. I have trail cameras out, and until I start getting that deer in daylight, I don't even go in there. Because if he's not coming in in daylight, I don't want to booger him. I don't want to push him because I have a small tract of land and I don't want to push him off there onto the neighbors. So the conditions have to be right. He has to be showing up in daylight. And then I use, in the last five years, I've really kind of gotten into it and, and it worked really good. And so what the moon guy does is you program in there what day you're going to hunt. And then it tells you whether those deer are going to be closer to the bedding areas whether they're going to be closer to the transitional areas or whether they're going to be closer to the destination food plots. And then according to what the moon guide says, I have several stands set up in several different scenarios. And that's the one I choose to hunt according to the moon guide, but I have to have him in daylight and I also have to have the wind in the right direction. You know, they make some great products, you know, as far as uh, scent control clothing, I use it all. I use scent control clothing. I use Sprint, the Scent Away Sprint, the spray. I use Ozonics. I mean, I use it all. And I think all of that helps. Now, I don't think you can 100% pull a mature buck's nose. So that's why I have it in that direction. So there's been multiple times that I drive three and a half hours because the weather says that it's going to be a northeast wind. And I get up to northwest Oklahoma and I got a south wind getting in there and trying to fool him, you know, because one time you bump him, you know, you're not going to get very many opportunities at a mature deer. So I have both. I have tree stands, I have ground blinds, and, and I think every situation is a little bit different. And so you have to be able to adapt and now you have to have several different scenarios and types of stands to hunt. Michael, you said a couple of key things. One, the conditions have, have to be in your favor and against the deer. So you want to tip it over the 50%, the 50-50 chance, because you want to be higher than 70%, because deer in the daylight, a moon phase, and the wind, those three things in your favor, that counts for a lot. No question about it. How about your access and your exit points? How do you do that and not get busted? Especially in the evening when the deer are already coming by, so, and they might be in the open. Absolutely. That's absolutely correct. So what I do is according to what the situation is, the wind, is there a high pressure system that's pushed through? You know, uh, is there a cool front? Whatever. I'm going to know by getting pictures of that deer 
at what times he's coming out and if I get a cool front or whatever. So I pretty well know by my topographical maps that I have, by my place, I know it. I've hunted it for a long time. I know where they bed. I know where they're going to feed. I know where that transition period is. So I know where all that's at. So what I do is, depending on if it's a morning or an evening hunt, I adjust. But what I do is I always enter and exit my stands away from where the deer activity is going to be. So if I know that the deer are bedded south of me, then I'm going to enter coming in from the north so that I'm not boogering any of that. And I'm going to make sure that I have a south wind before I do that. If I don't, if those conditions aren't right, then I don't hunt it. Even if I drove three and a half hours and I'm like, well, I'm already here. I might as well hunt. I don't do that. Everything has to be right. Now then, so I know that the deer are bedding south of me. They're going to be coming north to the food sources. So I'm going to enter in from the north to get in my stand, let the deer come to me. If I don't see him tonight or whatever, and they go on out to the alfalfa, the destination food sources south of me, whenever I leave, I'm not going to walk south with the wind and let the wind blow my scent right to them. I'm going to exit going either to the east or to the west and go back around and to wherever I park. So I think personally, I mean, your entrance and your exit to your stand is very critical. So folks, just take note of that and kind of think of, I don't care how many acres you have, you know, wind, activity, and moon phase. And there's a lot of debate about the moon phase, and I'll just leave it at that for our different show, and we'll get different people on to talk about the impact of a moon. I know, personally, the moon can be an asset or it can be a detriment, either in fishing or in hunting. I know that. Absolutely. I know that for a fact. So, uh, having said that, so tell us one more time how to get a hold of you or how to buy your product. So, you can call 580-334-4181 or 580-273-3320. Michael, anything you'd like to close with? I just say thanks very much for allowing me to come on here and talk to you for a little bit. I just really like talking about whitetail. Uh, Like I said, I'm not anybody special. I'm just an average, ordinary hunter that has a passion. I've just taken that passion a little bit further than most people. We've done a lot of research and development on deer and and deer nutrition, deer activity. And uh, like I said, I'm not going to ever talk bad about anybody's product. I don't care if you use my product or somebody else's. It's better than what Mother Nature provides. And like I said before, if you don't help your deer reach their genetic potential, Mother Nature is not going to do it other than age. And, And there's very few deer that get to reach that six, seven, eight years old maturity out in the wild that's going to grow that type of antler if you don't help them out. And there's there's certain seasons, there's certain years that we have droughts that we have to provide that nutrition for those animals. So like I said before, you know, it just depends on what you want. If you want to shoot a 160-inch deer, if you don't have a 160-inch deer, you're not going to be able to kill him. So the best chance that you have is to grow that deer and help him reach maturity so that you can harvest him. Thank you very much for having me on here. I really enjoyed it. And thanks for giving me the opportunity. Well, on behalf of thousands of listeners throughout North America, Michael Cleveland, thank you so much for being a guest. And I look forward to catching up with you down the road. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.